Thank you for joining us at Church Experience Online. If you'd like to learn more, find out a way to get connected to our community, or help fuel the movement by giving, simply click on the link to our website in the description below. So my two youngest kids, my two daughters and I were playing Duck, Duck, Goose the other day. It was the game that they came up with. They wanted to play. They were familiar with it. So picture me in the living room sitting on the floor in a little mini circle with a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And so we're there. We're hanging out. And Macy, my youngest, it was, it was her turn, you know, and she was going around the circle, you know, duck, 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 and you know, you're sitting there and you're waiting, me and Kira, our four-year-old, we're, we're sitting there waiting, you know, big smiles on our faces, like, is she gonna, is she gonna get us? You know, you, you, remember, you remember that play, game as a child, right? And, you, and you're just waiting for them to like put their hand on your head and say, goose, because if they do, your whole world changes. You go from like sitting in a moment of rest to like you get up and you run and you're chasing them before they get back. And she's going around, a little two-year-old, little smile on her face, can barely say the words, duck, <laughs> duck. <laughs> duck and she puts her hand on my head and she says goose and she takes off running now she's a little toddler in a diaper you know so she's just you know like this kind of thing but instead of running around the circle she's just excited to run and that someone's chasing her so she starts just running all the way around the house you know like big circles just running and i'm chasing her like where's she going you know we, we don't know where she's going she's just running she's just running everywhere and chasing her she finally makes her way back to her spot and she sits down and she's giggling you know and it's great 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 moment but you remember that that feeling right you remember playing that game or you, you've seen kids play that game, and you're sitting there, and it's that, that, that feeling, you know, that you have of like, is this, is this my moment, you know? And they're coming around the circle, duck, <laughs> duck, duck. And you're just waiting, you're hanging on that moment. Is this my moment? And, and I think that a lot of us, we feel in life pretty often like we're in that moment, right? We're waiting waiting for our future to fully load, waiting for God to show up, waiting for that prayer to be answered, waiting for that promotion at work, waiting for that relationship to come together, waiting for the finances to work out. I mean, we're waiting and in that waiting room of life. In fact, the title of today's message, what to do in life's waiting rooms, because I think that many of us we, we know exactly how it feels to be waiting on God. Maybe you showed up today and as you crashed into your seat, that's where you'd say you're at. You're waiting on God. And, and while you're waiting, last week we talked about how God is still at work while you're waiting. He's still working in our lives. But, but while you wait in that tension, I think, I think that a lot of us can feel anxious and worried because we're, we're kind of waiting on that next thing to come. We're waiting on that next season and just waiting for something different to happen. And there, there also can be not only anxiety and worry, but I think there can be fear. Maybe you have some of that in your life as you look out over the horizon and concern, and maybe there's disappointment because there is not here yet, and maybe there's some disillusionment, maybe there's some frustration, even anger, and you're, and you're just, you know, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I'm the only one, but it's that tension, and I, and I think you know exactly what I'm saying. It builds in us, and, and as we feel that weight of the world on our shoulders and we wonder, God, are you at work? And I, I would completely be willing to exchange today for tomorrow, but, but while you're, you're at work, could you just give me a clue of when it's going to happen? And as we wait on the edge of our seat, God is still working in our lives, and he's at work in your life, and he brought you here today for a reason. And we're going to look at the Word of God. We're going to look at the Bible, and I believe he's got some amazing lessons for us on how to live life in life's waiting rooms. There's a guy named Ken Emoff. And Ken is a car guy. Now, a lot, there's a lot of car girls or car guys out there, and, and some of them dream about one day owning some certain car, like it's their dream car. And, and for a lot of people, that car is way more expensive than what they can afford. For example, a Lamborghini, right? Maybe you've dreamed about driving or at least sitting in or putting eyes on a Lamborghini, you know, the iconic doors popping up in the air, the incredibly expensive vehicle, ridiculously expensive, far out of the price range of the average person in our country. 
And Ken, he had the dream of, of having a Lamborghini. That was his dream. He's a car guy. He dreamed about this. But his dad told him when he was young, he says, if you can make it, don't buy it. So Ken got this idea to build a Lamborghini from scratch, literally from scratch. He said, I'm going to build a Lamborghini from scratch. And he started working on it in his basement. He started putting this together literally from scratch. He's like, I'm going to build this Lamborghini. I can't afford to buy it, so I'm going to build it. He starts working on it in his basement. He thought it was going to take him five years. He's like, it's going to take me five years to do this. And so that whole time, that, all these years, he's designing, machining, welding, measuring, sanding, painting this Lamborghini from scratch in his basement. Ends up taking the guy, takes Ken 17 years, but he completes it. And he actually builds from scratch, true story, Ken builds this amazing Lamborghini. The only problem is it's in his basement. <laughs> he built the car in his basement, so, you know, how do I get it out? Digs a hole down, knocks, knocks a hole in the wall, and pulls the car out from his basement. I mean, it's crazy, crazy. It's like, people do this? Yes, that, that happens, and he did it. He got the car out, and but man, it's unbelievable to think that he had spent 17 years of his life waiting for that day to come, when it would be fully finished, when it would be completed. 17 years he waited, and maybe you're waiting for tomorrow to arrive today. And while you're waiting, you're worried, you're concerned, you're feeling the pressure of life. How do we live in the waiting rooms of life? How do we handle that tension that tomorrow is not today? <laughs> and we'd love to exchange today for tomorrow, but tomorrow is not here yet. And we, we were trying to live and honor God now while we wait for what's next. So how do we do that? Well, last week we began by talking about the nation of Israel and uh, God's people that we learned so much from in the Bible. And we, we set that story up. And if you missed it, you can go online and kind of catch up with where we're at. But, but basically, the, the, sh the short version of the history is, is that they found themselves in slavery in, in the land of Egypt. And, and they were waiting on God and, and would love to get to tomorrow where they weren't oppressed and in slave labor. And God did have a plan for that. In fact, he, through a miraculous set of circumstances, spared the life of this young boy. His name was Moses. And Moses was going to lead them, lead God's people, the Israelites, out of Egypt, out of slavery, into freedom. So God did have a plan, and we talked last week about how God was working even while they were waiting, and he was raising up Moses, but Moses just wasn't ready yet. He wasn't ready yet. And we talked about how sometimes we get anxious and we get ahead of God, and we run out ahead of him, and he's working and preparing our future. It's just not ready yet, and Moses was being prepared for what's next. However, we're going to pick up the story today as we see a little turn. In fact, it's not a little turn. It's a significant turn in Moses' life as he goes from being this privileged child in the home of King Pharaoh, growing up in a, a powerful nation with a lot of prosperity all around him, to being left a broken man with nothing. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people, the Israelites, were where they were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian, and he hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and he saw them fighting, and, and the long story short is that they gave him up. No word gets out, even gets to Pharaoh's household that, that Moses had killed one of the Egyptians to protect one of the Israelites. And so jumping down to verse 15, it says, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh. He went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So can you imagine that? Going from like prosperity. I mean, he's, he's in Egypt and he's privileged. He's living in the home of the Pharaoh. People like, they, they honor him as he walks by. They're like, there's, there's Moses, you know. I mean, he's raised literally in the family of Pharaoh. I mean, he's got everything he wants and needs. He's well fed. He's taken care of. He's got all this privilege in his life. He makes this, he makes this, uh, he has this horrible situation happen in his life and uh, makes some decisions that have huge consequences. And so he flees and he runs to a foreign land surrounded by a foreign people, sets down by a well, and there he is in a very short time in a place of brokenness. I know enough to know that there's some people here today that feel broken. And you can identify with Moses because you're sitting down around the, the well of your life and you've lost everything or at least you lost what you had hoped for. Your dreams are not here yet and you question if they're ever gonna arrive. You look at your past like Moses and there's something you're running from. You just feel broken. You feel empty. And Moses, that's where he's at. He's sitting down next to this well in a foreign place and he has nothing. 
absolutely nothing. He's broken. He has the clothes on his back, running for his life. He probably feels like a failure. And quick fact check, <laughs> you and I would probably agree with that. You know, failure, I mean, he, he has nothing. He owns nothing. He's accomplishing nothing. He's, he's just a broken man next to a well in a foreign country. And there he is. So here's my question for you. And I think it sets up well our first lesson here in your notes. How did that broken man, Moses, go from that place to later in his life being one of the most famous people of the Bible? If you were to think of godly leaders in the Bible, his name would rise to near the top. If you would think about someone who has made an impact that we read about, that God has done great things through their life, certainly Moses' name would be near the top of the list. Moses went on to lead millions of people. God used Moses to, f- to free an entire nation of people from captivity and from oppression in a, in a foreign nation. It leads them out into a, a better place. I mean, he, unbelievable what God does. Literally uses him to be an, a prominent leader, a godly leader that makes an impact. We're still talking about him. All these years later, all these centuries later, impacted millions of lives. How did that happen? How did he go from nothing? And you're like, man, I, I kind of i am with Moses, and so like, is there any hope for my future? Look what God did in his life. You know, the gap between where you are and where you need to be, that, that space, that gap between here and there, that gives God some room to work. The gap between where we are, the distance between reality and the future God has for us, that's where God wants to do his greatest miracles in your life. So don't despise where you are, because where you are is going to be a magnifying glass to point at the glory of what God's going to do in your future. You can't see it now, but like Moses, his brokenness reminds us that God has the ability to heal, to restore, to change, to forgive, to mend, to build up, and to do amazing things, even through our brokenness and our nothingness. God can raise up incredible things in our lives and build incredible things in through our lives. Here's the lesson in your notes. The place between your desperation and your destination is God's space. You know, when God is in it, the distance between here and there, that can't keep you from your destination. You're like, man, there's a lot of distance between where I am and where I know God wants to take me. Listen, that distance is nothing to God, and that distance cannot keep you from God's destination. Doesn't matter how far it is. Doesn't matter how difficult it is. Doesn't matter how, what the obstacles are. Doesn't matter what the heartbreaks are in between here and there. That's where God's going to get glory is as you move from here to there, he's at work. And that will show the world that it wasn't just about you, that it was about God and how he worked in your life. He's the miracle worker. You know, he specializes in doing miracles and turning our realities into our dreams. And, you know, if you don't give up, it can happen. Imagine Ken. Imagine Ken's story 17 years later. 17 years later, he's been tinkering around with this, this project in his basement. And then one day it's complete and he wrecks a hole in the wall and gets it out. And he gets it out on the street in front of his house. Imagine how good you would feel. You've dreamed about this for 17 years. Turning the ignition and, and, and firing up that Lambo. Imagine how he felt in that moment. You can get a little feel for it from this. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That rumble just gets you going inside, right? It's like, man, that's awesome. Man. Can you imagine those first few pieces that he put together? And then he's got enough that he can hold in his hand. And then one day, like, it's, the vision's complete. And he gets in it, turns the key on, and he drives away. Listen, that rumble in your life, that's going to happen. And that's going to be the, the rumble of God working out his plan. And right now, all you see is bits and pieces of the plan. And you, and you don't know how it's all going to come together and be anything that's going to take you to your destination. But God's saying, listen, I know there's a huge gap between where you are and where I want to take you. But you got to trust me to fill that gap. you got to trust me to work miracles because, listen, I'm God. That's what I do. That's what he's saying to you. He's saying, listen, trust me. I can do miracles in your life if you will give me your life and put your life in my hands. I can do amazing things in and through you if you let me work. It may not look like what you want it to look like. It may be a little different. But God will work out his plan as you trust in him and as you follow him. Let's go back to this story in Exodus chapter 2, verse 21. It says, Moses agreed to stay with a man, and he meets this man in this foreign land. He's sitting down by the well, and God makes a connection for him. And it says that this man, he gave his daughter Zephora to Moses in marriage. Zephora gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Jershom, saying, I have become a foreigner 
in a foreign land. And, you know, verse 23, it goes on and talks about how the, the king of Egypt, he dies, the Israelites groan in their slavery, they cry out, and their cry for help because, they are, uh, because their cry for help of slavery went up to God. So they're, they're, they're crying out to God and they're saying, God, we are stuck. Now Moses, he's no longer stuck. He's out, he's doing his own thing, he's getting settled, he's getting comfortable, he's building a new life. But the nation of Israel, they are stuck. And they are feeling the weight of oppression. You know what the weight of pressure feels like, right? You might be carrying it. You maybe brought it with you into this room. It might be sitting right next to you. <laughs> you might be carrying it. It might be in your wallet right now. It might be out in the parking lot. <laughs> You're hoping to get you home. It might be on Monday morning when you show up and clock in. Like, that's your pressure. I don't know what your pressure is. It might be when you get home today. But, like, that pressure is on you, and you feel it. And, and, and that pressure, the weight of the world that sits on you, the Israelites, they felt that pressure. But you know what they did? The pressure led to prayer. And they cried out to God, and they said, God, we need you. <laughs> and in their desperation, they cried out to God, and they said, God, break through for us. Help us. We need you. And in this moment, while they're waiting, you know, they're, they're waiting on God. Well, Moses is in a different kind of waiting situation. You know, he's, he's broken. He, he, they, he's, this man finds him, and they, they get connected and all this, and he develops a family. But there in his brokenness, he had to be wondering, like, is this the bottom? Does it get any worse than this? And, and I love Psalm 130. I, I have to think that this is how Moses felt Maybe how the Israelites felt. Maybe how you feel. But Moses there in his brokenness with his past, sitting beside the well, I wonder if this is kind of how he felt. Psalm 130 verse 1, it says, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? You come in here today and you're like, I got a past. I'd love to get to my future, but I'm running from my past, and I don't know how I'm going to overcome it. What does God think about my past? Are you sure God still ha cares about me, and does, how does he look at me, I mean, in light of what I've done? Listen, God loves you, and his love for you is greater than your sin. And, and if it was all about our sin, who of us could stand? The Bible says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Moses, you know, he, he knew his shortcomings. He fell short, and as he, as he was there as a broken man, he had to feel this way. God, you know, I have this past, and... You know, what, what about my future? And, and it goes on in verse 4, it says, But with you, God, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I will wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. God, I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to wait for you. And I, I don't see it now, but I'm going to wait. And you might be in a waiting room, waiting on God, waiting for what's next, waiting for your future to fully load in your life. But in the waiting, you get down, but God might be using your situation to build you up. You, you're discouraged. You're down because of your situation, but God might be building up a better future than, for you that you don't see. It might be that woman here who is really discouraged that she can't pay the bills with her current job. And, and she's on somewhat of a mountaintop because she got that job and she prayed for that job and she worked hard to get that job, but that job now is not meeting the bills and she's a single mom with a couple kids or whatever the situation. And, and, and she's like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do because I now have a crisis and I have this, this prayer and what am I gonna do? And she might have to go through a valley, planned or unplanned, to get to a higher mountaintop and maybe God will use this waiting season, maybe even this crisis, this pressure, to bring her to a higher point to get her a better job that provides for her where she can actually provide for her family. And here's what I'm saying. Sometimes we go through valleys. Sometimes we get to a place where we are, we've peaked and we're struggling and we're, we're, we're not seeing how it's going to work out. And God's saying, well, listen, I have something better for you, but to get from here to there, you've got to trust me with the gap. And in your desperation, come to me because I do have something better planned for you. You, see, you have to trust me. And, and to get from here to there, you can't map that out. You can't plan that. You don't know what's around the corner, but God has something greater. So just put your lives in, in, in his hands. Trust him. Step out. Follow him. Honor him. Let him lead you from here to there, and he'll take care of it. God's got you. In your notes, waiting rooms provide a place to prepare for what's next. Maybe this is your waiting room. You don't want to wait anymore. But maybe this waiting room is a gift to you. You know? You ever get impatient in waiting rooms? You're like, come on, man, call my name. Call my name. <laughs> come on, call my name. I've been waiting forever in this waiting room. There's a long line. Call my name. Call my name. And Jesus is like, listen, I'm going to call your name.
But the time is not right yet. I'm giving you a gift to prepare you for what's next. See, I think that there's some times where what's next is harder than what we realize. And you're going to be running, maybe sprinting, and God's resting you in the waiting room. And he's giving you a gift. Let me just show you a story from our, our lives. So when we came down to start this church, it was a whole journey. I've told you before of the, the challenge of letting go of the comfort and, and familiarity to step out into the unknown and start a church. But there's a part of that story now that I've learned so much about in between. Because uh, when we were coming down, uh, Jennifer was pregnant with our fourth kid. And we were about to come help birth a new church. But we had to birth a new baby first. And we're like, well, how is that going to work simultaneously? And a good friend of mine, a mentor, Pastor Kevin Myers, 12 Stone Church, gave me the opportunity to come on their staff for seven months. Not to carry anything, just to come and learn and grow, have the baby, and take care of us while we're there, and just invest in us, let us plan, prepare, and pray for what would be next. And to me, in the moment, that was a waiting room. I knew that we were going to be here, but we were up there. And I couldn't wait to leave up there in a lot of ways, although I enjoyed it. It was a blessing to be there. I couldn't wait to get on the ground and say, all right, God, I'm ready. I've been praying about this for a long time. I've been, I'm preparing. I'm ready to go. Come on. God, could you just call my name? God, call my name. Let me. I'm ready. I'm ready to serve you. You called us, and we left everything. We're ready to go. And God said, all right, wait seven more months. And so we waited there. We had the baby. We went, our Michigan house had not sold yet. We lived there five and a half years. It was on the market. It was a bad market. We're waiting for it to sell. We're waiting, waiting, waiting. And so we had to find a place to live while we were in Atlanta for seven months for our pretty good-sized family of five, soon-to-be family of six. And so we needed to find a decent-sized place to live. Now, the problem was we're still paying on our mortgage in Michigan. We need to find a place to rent in Georgia. We're like, we don't know how that's financially going to work out, but we knew we had to find the cheapest place as possible. And one of the pastors talked to some people in the church. Somebody uh, had a, a, a guy in the church, and, and, and he had this really nice home, and he was commuting to the city for work. Didn't like the drive. He says, you know what? I'm going to move down to the city. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the house, you know, so you know, I'll, I'll rent it out to you, and I'll give you a really good price. So we get to go. We move into this really nice house. We're living in this really nice house for seven months. Amazing provision for our family. Have our baby there. It's this great season of rest for us. In that time, check this out. It's crazy. So he moves out. So he's looking for a place, thinking about moving down to the city. He's getting more serious with his girlfriend, who's out of state. She's finishing up school, whatever. And, and so he's like, I'm just going to crash with my parents down the road for a little while. So he's staying at his parents these months, you know, thinks he's going to the city. He never eventually goes in that seven months. He stays with his parents the whole time. So he's collecting this extra check, right? He's, no, his expenses haven't gone up, but now he's got this extra income. So he's saving up. Him and his girlfriend get real serious. They decide to get married. He's like, well, what, family, all that, you know, living in the city. I'm just going to move back into my place, you know, once they leave. And so we left. We move down here to start the church. In the meantime, our house had sold. Look, look what happened looking back on it. It's crazy. So God provides for this guy gives him some extra income as he's saving up and getting ready to get married, right? Moves him out of his house for seven months so he can move this family who needed a place to stay into the house. Moves us out, moves him back in. He's blessed. He's taken care of. Now he's married. He's where he really needed to be and didn't waste the time going out. I mean, it's amazing. I look back, I'm like, God, you, how did, you could have planned that. That's crazy. Move someone out of their house, move them back in, and somehow it was a blessing to them and a blessing to us. God, how did you do that? I'm just blown away. But that was a waiting room for us. We didn't know how it was going to work out. But God was so in that. Man, we prayed and God provided and he worked through it. In the moment, I didn't see it. In the moment, I'm like, God, get me where I need to be. And he's, listen, I'm going to rest you because you know what? We moved down in the whole craziness. I have a newborn baby and four kids and a little apartment and like two other families and trying to start a church from nothing and, and all the work. That was the hardest year of our lives. We worked so hard. It was intense. It was tough. And, and I mean, I just, there's so much and, and it was intense. And you guys know if you're new, church is a little over a year old now. It's awesome. But man, in that moment, in the desperation, I mean, it was a lot. And I didn't know that we were going to be running so hard. And God, God said, hey, I'm going to give you this little season to rest you before you run. And here's what I'm saying to you. In your story right now, you only see a little slice of it. God sees the whole picture. He knows what you need next. And you're like, God, I'm ready to run. I'm ready, I'm ready to be at next now. And I, I want that to be. And God said, I'm giving you a gift. I'm giving you a waiting room in life so that I can rest you and prepare you for what's next. Because you're going to run. In fact, you're going to run, and it might be a sprint, so now I need to rest you, and now you're in this waiting room. You're anxious, but don't be anxious. Trust me. Prepare. Prepare in this season. Prepare your heart. Prepare your character. Because waiting rooms, in your notes, they, they provide a place to prepare for what's next. They provide a, a gift to us, a, a place to prepare, a place to grow. Let's go back to this story in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. We read this, the Israelites, they groaned in their slavery. They cried out, and they cried for help. 
and went up to God, and God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Um, so God, God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. And I just, I just love that, that God's concerned about us in our moments of pain. He's concerned about you in your moments of lack of. He cares for you. Even when you don't in that moment see how things are going to work out, some people in those moments, they pull away from God. Well, God, I, you, you didn't have it go how I wanted it, and so I, I'm, I'm just going to pull away from you. But I've noticed that other people, that they press in in those moments, and they tap strength that others never find, and God empowers them to get, it through, get through those moments, and it's amazing what happens on the other side. So are you in that moment right now? You preparing for what's next? The Israelites, you know what they did when they were waiting, when they were stuck in slavery? You know what they did when it was hard? They prayed. They cried out to God. And God heard them. It says he was concerned. He was concerned about them. And, and here's what we need to know is that God is concerned about our situation. God, God loves you, and he hears you. And, and when you cry out to him in your desperation, God knows. He knows what's going on in your life. And, and, and in your notes, maybe you want to write this down. Persistent, genuine prayer changes everything. Persistent, genuine prayer changes everything. I think powerful prayer lives can be birthed out of pain. You know, it's, it's when we go through the trials, it's when we're tested, that, that God develops inside us in our character greater depth in our relationship with God. It's in those moments in the fire that we're being refined. And you, and you feel the waiting room, you feel the pressure, you feel the intensity of it, and God's allowing that so that you can be stronger when you come out on the other side. He's wanting to do more in your life. He's, he's wanting to do greater things in your life. But right now, he's refining you, he's shaping you, he's preparing you. And in that moment, in the time of pain, your prayer life can grow. And when you cry out to God in genuine prayer, listen, that changes everything. That changes everything. You know, prayer is a thing that can change your situation the most, but it's probably the thing that you and I do the least when we really need to. God is wanting to draw you closer to him in the, ch in, the ch in the challenges. Austin Phelps, he wrote a book on prayer, and in his, his book, he talked about Ethelfrith, the pagan Saxon king of Northumbria, who invaded Wales, this Christian nation, and he was getting all of his troops out on the battlefield, and, and they were all assembled and, and ready to attack, and they look out on this Christian nation, Wales, and they're assembling for this battle too, and, and there's a, a group of unarmed men that are there among the whole Wales battle force. And he notices this as he's forming his attack strategy and he sees that there's a group of men who are unarmed and he asks one of his advisors, who are these unarmed men out on the battlefield? And the answer that he's got is that these are Christian monks of Bangor and they're, they're praying for the success of their army. Well, Ethelfrith, he knew immediately that this was something serious, and he was a pagan king, didn't, didn't acknowledge and believe their beliefs, but he knew that that mattered. And so this is literally what he said. He said, attack them first. He said, attack them first. That's where the real power is. You know, don't, don't go after, don't go after their, their main force and what you see. It looks like the battle. I mean, go after, the, go after those who are praying. And listen, your real power in your life is in your prayer life. It's your prayers. That's where the battle is won. That's, that's your source of strength. That's where you need to trust. You know, we, we pray to God. I, I heard one pastor say it like this one time. It stuck with me. He said, you know, we pray for God's resources when what we really need to pray for is, is, is the source for God to come through because that's what we need. And, and you and I get our eyes on so many of the, the things that we need, we lack, and all the, the questions, the problems. And, and what we really need is to turn our eyes to the Father and say, God, you're a good Father. You know my situation. I'm, I'm battling before you in prayer, and I'm asking you to come through. I'm asking you to help. I'm asking you to deliver. I'm asking you to provide. And you do that, and that's the most powerful weapon that you have. Job chapter 5. I want to read to you uh, a verse that's been really amazing for me. Uh, before I read this, you know, Jennifer and I, we had a rare moment the other night uh, being out uh, without the kids. And that's always a great moment. We love our four kids, but let's be honest, when you're, you're with them all the time, it's nice to have mommy-daddy time and just look at each other and have a conversation without people climbing on you. And so we're, we're in a restaurant, and we're talking and, and having a good conversation and, and all that. And, and the waiter comes out, and he's got the menus, and we're looking over the menus. And, and I'll tell you what, I am a simple eater. So I'm looking down at all this stuff on the menu and all the different, you know, fancy entrees and all that. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not super impressed with that. Like, I'm like, dude, if Jennifer is good with it, like, on any given date night, I'm good with, like, Chick-fil-A. Give me some Jesus chicken. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
chicken sandwich and fries. I'm trying to quit on the fries. It's a bad thing, but fries, honey mustard, you know, a barbecue chicken pizza. Come on. I'm, just, I'm a simple eater. I'm a simple dude. Like I just, I'm happy with that. So I'm seeing all these entrees. I'm like, okay, that's cool. They got the, the grilled chicken breast, you know, entree with all this stuff piled on it and around it. Okay, that's good. And, and then they, they got like, I was surprised they had like a gourmet type hamburger thing on there, but they had a burger with the bun and all that stuff, right? And then they had another like appetizer type thing or something that had like fries. So I'm like, so why don't they have like a, a grilled chicken sandwich with fries? It's like a basic, like they don't have that on the menu, right? And so my, the waiter comes and I'm just sitting there and it's, I'm trying to be low maintenance, but I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, trying, like, hey, so is there any way, you know, I, I notice on the meal that, or on the menu that there's no chick, grilled chicken sandwich with fries, but I noticed that you have a grilled chicken breast, you know, in this one. And, and I noticed that you have a bun on, on, this, on this one and you got some fries. Is there any way you can go in the kitchen and like hook me up? Is there like, can you... Find a way to like, you know, ring that up somehow. And I'm trying to be cool, but you know, I mean, it is what it is. So I, I'm just asking, and, and, he, and he, he's real cool about it. He's like, you know, we probably can't do that. You know, it's a busy restaurant and all that. We probably can't do that. I'm like, hey, no worries. I just thought I would ask, not a problem. I order something else. He comes back about five minutes later. He's filling up our drinks. He's like, hey, man, I kid you not. This is his exact words to me. He goes, he goes, I pledge your case with the cook and I got you hooked up. He's like, you got a grilled chicken sandwich. You got fries coming your way. The smile on my face was priceless. I'm like, yes, so good. My wife's like, stop eating the fries. It's bad for you, you know? But he literally said that phrase, and it stuck with me because he said, I pled your case. And you know that that's what prayer is? You're going before God, and you're saying, God, here's what's going on in my life. I'm pleading my case before you. Listen, listen to Job. Job chapter 5, verse 8. This is so good. But if I were you, I would appeal to God. You know, sometimes people tell me as a pastor their situation, and it's, it's discouraging because I can't fix it for them. I want to. I, I love to help people. That's just kind of like, I, I just love to help people. I love, I love to help people. But I've had to come to realize I can only help so much. I cannot fix everybody's problems. And if I have a bunch of people telling me their problems, man, it, it can get me down if I forget that that's not my job. I can do as much as I can, and where I can, I love to help. But I can only, and you, if you're one of those people, you can't fix everybody's problems. But you can point someone to the person who can fix their problems. So I love to put an arm around someone and say, hey, man, can I pray for you? And sometimes I can find other ways to help people and there's connections and things I can make for them. But, but a lot of times I have to put a hand on their, on their shoulder and pray for them. And I know that that's the most powerful thing that I can do in their life. And he says, if I were you, and this is kind of what I'm saying to them, if I were you, I would plead my case. I would plead my case to God. I would appeal to God, he says. I would lay my cause before him. Listen to what it says. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Miracles. I mean, you want some God to come through in your life? He performs miracles that cannot be counted. This is our God. He provides rain for the earth. Now listen to this. Listen to where, look at where we're sitting today. And he says that he provides rain on the earth. He sends water on the countryside. Come on, man. As I pray for you guys, that's awesome. Come on, guys, send it. We'll take it, right? Listen, God, send your blessing on us. Like, plead your case before him. Come before God and, and say, God, here's, here's what's going on in my life. I'm just getting real, and this is where it's at, and I need your help. Plead your case before God, and powerful prayers are birthed from pain. You're in a waiting room. You're finding pain in your life. You're finding a lack of. Let that be the spur that causes you to cry out and pray big prayers for God. God, I don't know what's next. I know that you're moving in my life, but God, I trust that you're already there. I believe that you're going to come through. I believe that you're going to provide. I believe that you're going to do greater things. And ultimately, listen, the answer to your prayer is, is, is one word. Every prayer that you can pray, there's one answer to it. It's the same answer for all of us. It's, it's the name of Jesus. Because Jesus ultimately fills every desire you have. And when you pray, you have some kind of unmet desire in your life. And Jesus can fill every desire in your life. He is the fulfillment of every desire you have. That's the emptiness that you feel inside. It's for more of Jesus. We try to fill it with all kinds of other stuff. But ultimately, in the end, it's Jesus. But we still have needs and we still have requests and we pray to God and that's a good thing. Listen to what uh, pastor and author Timothy Keller, he's a pastor in New York City, and listen to what he wrote. He says, this is the safety catch on prayer. Without it, wise people would never pray again. This is, this is a really important part of prayer. He says that we can be sure that if we ask something that wouldn't be best for us, God won't give it to us. So if you ask for something and it's not best for you, God won't give it to you. We must have the assurance, he writes, that he will answer the basic desire, but find a form and a mode that isn't harmful to us. So God will answer your prayer, but he may not answer it in the mode that you ask for him to, because that might not be best for you. And God is wise enough, 
and he's good enough and he's kind enough that when you cry out to him and you say, God, this is what I need, that he knows what you really need and what you're asking for may be destructive to you. It may not get you where you need to go. It might be harmful to you. It might pull you away from him. It might bring other consequences into your life that you don't see. And he says, listen, I'm a good father. I love you. You you bring your desire to me. I want you to come. You let me know what you need and I'll take care of you but I'm gonna take care of you in the timing and in the way that's best for you. So pray, and it makes a difference, it changes things. And God, it says he heard the cry of the Israelites, he heard them in their slavery, he heard them in their oppression, and God changed their situation. You're gonna see that. In the coming days, you're gonna see how God changes their situation. Let's go back to this story one more time in Exodus chapter three. So Moses, you know, this broken man who's now rebuilding out of the ruins. And man, rebuilding from the ruins is no fun because you got all kinds of stuff you're working through. It's not a clean slate. It's, it's all the messes of your past. And, and he's rebuilding. He's starting a new family, a new life. And in the midst of his comfort, God comes to him and he meets with him. In his waiting room of life, God meets with him. And here's what I want you to know. In your waiting room, God will meet you and he'll find you. Exodus 3 verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight while the bush bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to, to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Jacob is the one God changed his name to Israel. He says, I'm, I'm their God. I'm your God. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I love that because my cry to God is not unheard by him. His ears hear your cries and and they're crying out to God. He says it's reached him. And it says that I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. God sees us. Verse 10, so now... And now all this, at this point, if you pause the story here before I read this, this next verse, Moses has to be like, God, that's awesome. Like, I, you know, I had to leave and rebuild, and I'm over here, and I got a new life going. That's great. And so the fact that, you're, God, that you're going to go help all, all my people, you're going to go help my people, and that's a bad place. I mean, they tried to kill me. I'm, I ran from them, and like, I had to, this, my past is back. I'm whew, so glad I'm not there anymore. That's a bad place. And those people are bad dudes, man. That'd be beating people and killing people. And God, thank you that you're finally, you're going to help. You, you heard their prayer. You're going to rescue them. <laughs> That's awesome, God. He had to be feeling that way, right? I mean, this whole point, this point in the conversation, this is, yay, God. This is awesome. Verse 10, I love how it changes. You can imagine Moses' face if you could watch him in this moment as it changes. So now, <laughs> so now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Whoa! <laughs> All right, wait, wait, can you repeat that? I mean, I, love, I was with you, like, bringing the people out, but you want me? Like, I, I'm, on, I'm on their hit list, man. I'm, I'm most wanted. Like, you want me to go back and bring the people out. Is that what you're saying? It's like, you know, so we get excited about God working. But when he asks us to work, <laughs> we want God to call people out, but he calls us out. We're all about the idea of, like, stepping out of comfort and sacrifice. But then when he asks us to sacrifice, Easy, guys. So you, you want me to go? And, and, and he called Moses out. And he asked Moses to leave the comfort of his career, his family, this new place, and to walk with him. To walk with him. And, and Moses is going to hear God's voice, and he's going to move on that. But you know, in your waiting room of life, you know, maybe even in your comfort, God, God will call you out. His voice is there with you. His, his voice is, in fact, his voice is our comfort. His, voice, his presence is our power. His, he's there with us in the midst of our struggle. Uh, you know, I grew up with uh, Happy Meals. I had two brothers, and my parents, I think that, I mean, you want to keep your kid happy, you got these three crazy boys, you're like, let's go to McDonald's, it's going to give you a Happy Meal, and they give you a little box, and they feed you, so I don't have to do it, I don't got to clean up, and they have a toy in it. I mean, it's perfect, genius idea for parents, right? You know, here you go, Happy Meal in a box, your kid's happy. 
Jennifer, she, I have great memories from McDonald's growing up with the Happy Meal thing, but she is burnt out on McDonald's. She's good if she never goes into McDonald's again because her family, her and her siblings, they would drive cross country to California. And mom and dad, well, that's, that's a cheap place to eat. It's affordable and the same thing. It's good for the kids. So they would eat at McDonald's like every stop. McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. And so she's like, I'm, I'm, I've had so much McDonald's in my life. I'm good. I'm, I'm tapped out on McDonald's. But, but nonetheless, when, when our son got old enough, we're like, man, we got to have the experience. We got to have the Happy Meal experience. And so we went and we took him in there and, and they had that box. I'm like, this is going to be great, son. I mean, they're going to give you food and a toy in the box. It's awesome. And so I'm more excited than he is. Opens it up and they pull out the little toy in the plastic bag and rip it open. And, and it happened to be the toy, his first time there, it happened to be the toy, um, the little zebra. If you remember the movie, movie uh, Madagascar was out. And so this was uh, the toy that was in there was this little zebra and it talked to you. It was on a motion. So if it moved, it would talk. It, would, it had a battery in it. It would move. It would talk. And, and the things it would say, I remember still, it would be like, holler at your boy. That's what it said. Holler at your boy. And, and, and it, where he'd say the other line was like, you guys are crazy. And he'd say it just like that. You guys are crazy. You know, and so he, would, he loved this thing. And he would, he would have so much fun with it. And he would be playing with it. Well, it got left in the car one day and it got left on. We go inside, hanging out, put the kids to bed, wake up the next day. I go out get in the car to leave by myself. I put the car in reverse. I'm pulling out of the driveway, the car's moving, and all of a sudden, I think I'm in, alone in this car by myself. <laughs> I hear this voice from behind me say, you guys are crazy. I'm like, Woo! what's going on? I'm like looking around like, who's, who's about to mug me, you know? The zebra's in the back. Shut it down, right? It's like, come on, out of nowhere. You know, see, listen, like, you know, I, I thought I was alone. And, and you, I know that you're going through stuff in your life. You think you're alone. You're not. The voice of God is with you in your pain. The voice of God is with you in your hardship, in your lack of, in your uncertainty. God is right there with you. You don't have to do it alone. You, you, you may think you're alone, and you may try to do it alone, and you might try to work through it alone, but you don't have to. God is there with you in that space, and that's God's space. That desperation that you got going on between here and the destination, that's God's space. He owns that, and if you let him come and work in your life, come on. God's going to raise up some amazing things. That's where the miracles are going to happen. That's where when people look at your life one day, they're going to look at you and say, man, I don't know how Moses, man, he was broken. He had nothing. He was, man, he's messed up. He had a past. There's all kinds of stuff. But look what God did. And look what God did in his life. That was a God thing. That was not a Moses thing. That was a God thing. Too big. It's too big for Moses. Moses is a broken man. But look what God did. And God's going to do greater things in your life. Even through this waiting room of your life. And here's the point. It's a lesson in your notes. God knows how to find the faithful. He does. He knows how to find the faithful when the time is right. You know, you and I think that we're going to miss out on God's plan like he's trying to trick us. I'm in this waiting room, and God, could you please just call my name? Call my name, God. Call my name. Call my name. And, you know, we th okay, maybe that's my name, and it's not really your name, but you think that, and you run and you chase something, but that's not for you. That's not, but, but you're so anxious to move on. We're so anxious to get to the next thing, and, and you're saying, I, I, this must be, and, and we run into things, and, and we're not ready yet. The time's not ready. It's premature. And we miss out sometimes, and we just have to trust. We have to rest on the fact that when God knows we're ready and when our situation's ready, he knows how to find the faithful. He's going to call your name. He's going to call your name. And Moses, he, God gave him this amazing moment of rest and rebuilding in his life and maturing. I had to imagine so much maturing in his life in this time and perspective. But you know what? God knew where to find the faithful. He knew where to find the man he needed. And he knows where to find the woman he needs. And he's going to come and he's going to tap you when the time is right. You say, all right, it's time. It's time to make that change. It's time to step it up. It's time to, to, to make this, this situation different. And, and, he, and he's going to call you out. And, and don't, you don't have to take my word for this. Take, take God's word for this. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Picture the eyes of God up in heaven looking around, looking for people whose hearts are fully committed, and he's strengthening them. He's raising them up. He's getting them ready, and he said, listen, Moses, you're ready. I'm ready to call you out. Now, Moses, you would think, okay, so that's a huge honor. God's speaking to me from in the bush. He's calling me out, so he's, he's ready for me. All right, let's do this, right? You would think that that's what Moses would do in light of who he's talking to, but that's not how Moses responds. Let's, let's look at this again. Uh, verse 11, he's, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Who am I? He says, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses says, who am I? 
He's insecure. Maybe you're insecure. In your waiting room, maybe you're insecure. Who am I? (laughs) God, who am I? You know what God said to Moses? That doesn't really matter. I've made you on purpose. You're you're amazing, and I have a great plan for your life, but that's not the point. He says, I will be with you. God says, it's really about me and my power. It's not really about you. So yeah, if if you're measuring your future on your own abilities, then you have concern to say, who am I? Then you might be a great person and have a lot of potential, but it's nowhere near what your potential is with God. And God says, listen, Moses, the point is not who are you. The point is who am I? And I am sending you. And, and God has all kinds of power that, that Moses can tap into. And he, and he says, Moses, don't worry about it. I'm with you. All right, so you don't got to be insecure. Unfortunately for Moses, he is a lot like us, and that's not his only reservation. Verse 1, the conversation goes on with him and God. In chapter 4, he says, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me, and they say the Lord did not appear to you? So now he's got fears, and he's like, well, God, what if? What if? Did you know that your what ifs can keep you from God's plan in your life? Well, what if, God? I, I think you want me to step out. I think you want me to do this, but, but what if? What if this happens? What if I, I can't do that? And what if this? And our fears can limit our future if you will let them. But God's got something more planned for you. And then finally, there's one more uh, excuse that he gives to God. It's found in, in Exodus chapter four, verse 10. So he's, he's speaking with God and God's calling him to go. And, and in verse 10, he says, so now uh, go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people to the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Let me jump down, uh, excuse me, verse, 11, verse 13. Uh, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? He has this huge dialogue with God. And down in verse 13, Moses answered God, um, or excuse me, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Let me jump ahead. Chapter four, verse 10. Found my spot. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes the deaf mute? Who gives, the sight, who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say. And then finally, this last verse I want to read, verse 13, look at this. Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. I can't believe this. Please send somebody else. Can you believe that? Like God is calling him. And he says, send somebody else. I'm not good enough. And in, in his insecurity, his fear, his lack of confidence in God almost causes him to miss out on one of the greatest miracles of the Bible. You know, God using him to part the sea, God using him to provide miraculously for his people in the desert, all these different things that you read about in the story of Exodus. It's amazing. Here, here's the point of all this. Moses had to learn what you and I have to learn. When we walk with God, we walk by God's strength. We walk by God's power, not our own power. We're not backed by our own resources. We're backed by God's resources. We're not provided for by our own provision. We're provided for by God's provision. We're not directed by our own intelligence. We're directed by God's leadership. He works through all of us and all that, but it's him that's leading us. Moses didn't have it all together. You might not either, but God's still at work in your life. He still has plans despite your excuses, despite your flaws, despite your failures, your shortcomings, your needs. God is at work in your life. Moses had good excuses, but God says, I have better reasoning than you, Moses. You need to trust me. You need to listen to me. So in your notes, the final lesson is this, if you want to write it down. While life is loading, am I listening to God? While life is loading, am I listening to God? I want to read one more verse as we close here. But, you know, I think that God is at work in our story, even when we don't realize it, even when we're busy about the task of doing what we need to do. And you remember, Ken, where we started today? Well, God was at work in his life, and he was going to actually do something in ministry through Ken. Despite what he was focused on, he thought it was about a car. It wasn't about a car. It was about his family. It was about God wanting to use him in ministry. Check this out. I met my wife. She borrowed me money for transmission while we were dating, and I said, that's that's the kind of girl that I want to marry. I started the project at the end of my honeymoon in the basement. For 17 years of my life, it was my life. For along the line, it turned into an obsession, and she knew it, and I had my head stuck in the sand, and that's when my life started to spiral out of control. I came home one night after work, and I got the Dear John letter on the kitchen table. said, I can't take this anymore. I've taken our three-year-old daughter 
And I think at that point I realized it was an obsession. And I prayed to God to help me fix this. Um, I don't know what to do. I don't want to be a divorced dad with a daughter that I would share with my ex-wife. I at that point decided I wasn't going to spend every night in the basement anymore. My wife and I reunited. We got now two kids and the project now got very lengthy. That's why it took over 17 years is I was very cognizant of time being spent away from my family. I devoted a lot more time to my family. The car symbolized to me the man I used to be. I thought the best way was to remove it. Mark and David came to me and said, I think there's a better purpose for this car all along. We, we like to call it as a hook, to draw people in and then hear the story. They're putting priorities in your life where they need to be. Your salvation, number one. Your family, too. And if that gets them in the front door and I'm able to witness to them, and, uh, and maybe they walk away with just a little nugget, just something, then I'm, I'm doing what I should be doing. See, God wanted to do something in ministry through Ken, and he thought it was just a project, but God's got, like, I got better plans for you, man. I'm even rescue your marriage in this. I'm going to do something. And while you're in your waiting room, I just here's what I want to say. God, God is at work in your life. And while you wait, he's at work. You got to trust him. Put your life in him and listen. Listen for him, and he, and he will find you, and he will lead you. Let me close with this verse today before we close in a song together. This is found in Galatians chapter 6. Verse 9, and I hope that this breathes new hope into you today as you leave and go out of this place. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Let us not become weary. Anybody here today just feel weary? I mean, let, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, at the proper time, we will, I love that, it's so confident. It's like we will reap a harvest if, everybody say if. Amen. Come on, say if. Amen. If we do not give up. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest. God's will will be done in your life. If you're dialed into him, if you're following him, if you're honoring him, if you're living for him, listen, God's will will certainly be done if you are following him and he will work out his plan. It's gonna be better than your plan. It's gonna be awesome. But listen, there's confidence to say that it will happen. But you know what's on the other side of that? There's an if, if. <laughs> it says if, did you catch that? It says if, if, if we do not give up, if we are faithful. See, you, you have a dream and you're like, God, I want your dream to happen in my life. And God's saying, yes, it can happen if you will be faithful. And you're saying, God, I want your peace to come in my life. And he says, yes, my peace can come in your life if you will lay down sin. He says, you know, I, God, I, I want miracles to happen in my life. I want you to do a miracle. And he's like, yes, it can happen if you will honor me. God, I have a need and I want you to bless me. I need your blessing in my life. Yes. If you live for me, and if it's the right thing, and if it's good for you, I will. God, I want joy in my life. And he's saying, yes, if you will follow Jesus, I will bring the joy into your life. If you honor me, if you follow me, if you listen to me, you will hear me. I will accomplish my good plans, even through your waiting rooms of life, if you will live for me, and if you will listen. And like Moses, I'll tap you when you're ready, and I will do amazing things in your life and in your future. Right on. Well, we hope you enjoyed the teaching. And we also hope you'll be able to apply what you learn to your everyday life. And again, if you want to find out more about us, find out ways to get connected, or start giving financially, simply click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for stopping by, and we hope to see you in person soon.